Good morning, good morning, good morning, Calvary Chapel Star. How are you guys doing this morning? It's so wonderful to be here with you guys this morning. Um, our pastor, Pastor David, is taking some well-deserved time off to rest and recover. Um, our, I got to tell you, our pastor is one of the hardest working men I've ever met in my life. And so I am exceedingly glad that he's taking some time off to rest and recover. And um, so he'll be back with us, not this next week, but the, the week after that. So this next week, we actually have a guest person that's going to come in and teach. His name is Dr. Stephen Collins, and that's going to be amazing. That's next week. So make sure uh, to be there for that. And then this morning, though, we're going to, um, if you, oh, by the way, who is here the entire study for the book of First John? Was everybody here? Right. If you weren't, if you haven't heard every one of those messages, I suggest that you go to our website or go to the app and listen to the messages. I, I got to tell you, I've been through lots of different studies, but First John, first of all, the last two weeks, I'm not a crying kind of guy. I'm just not. I was all weepy every service. I was like, what are you doing to me, Pastor David? It was so good and so convicting. So if you haven't had the chance to kind of um, dig into, into that, go back to our website, watch those messages. They're really terrific. But this morning, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. Again, that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. Um, this morning's message is entitled, The Spirit, the Flesh, and the Fruit. And would you all stand up for the reading of God's word? Starting in verse 16. I say then, walk in the spirit, and, sh and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, unclean, uh, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we dig into your word, we ask you, Lord, that you'd speak to us, Father. Lord, thank you for this season that we can be in a corporate environment like this, Lord Jesus, opening your word. And, and learning more about you, God, what a privilege it truly is, Father. We ask you, Lord, that this morning you'd speak to us through your word, Lord. Lord, we understand that wisdom doesn't come from a man, Lord. Wisdom comes from you, Father. So we pray, Lord, that you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You, you may all be seated. So i got a question for you. How do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you're saved? Are you led by the law? Or are you led by the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26 focuses on how the Holy Spirit gives believers the power to serve others in love. We must allow the Holy Spirit to lead However, when we don't, our selfishness will lead us into all kinds of sinful lifestyles. When we live by the Spirit, 
on the other hand, we can gain more than just being able to not live in sin. What comes out of us are a collection of powerful and positive characteristics. Those who trust in Jesus have been set free. Paul's readers were in danger of wasting that freedom by veering off in one of two directions. On one hand, false teachers were pressuring them into legalism, requiring circumcision and the like, in order to be sure of being right with God. And on the other hand, freedom can also be squandered on serving only our sinful desires instead of investing it through serving others in love. Paul was writing to the church of Galatia because legalism was creeping into the church. He sent a clear message that conformity to the law does not justify man before a holy, righteous, just God. Galatians chapter 2 verses 16 reminds us that knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for the works of the law no by for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. Now verse 16 where we started off I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now the word lust means strong desire. And the expression walk in the spirit is a metaphor that the apostle Paul uses to describe the way in which believers are called to live. Basically to be led by the Holy Spirit or controlled by the Holy Spirit or governed by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verses 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Once we received Christ into our hearts, we made him Lord and Savior of our life, there is an indwelling of the Holy Spirit that takes place. And we're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 through 20, It says this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, liberty or freedom can degenerate into license. We should never use our liberty as a license to sin. The Holy Spirit enables us to subdue the lust of the flesh when we continuously submit ourselves to his power and to his control. If we backtrack just a little bit to uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 13, Paul reminds us that for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Paul is describing how those in Christ should be living. Paul reminds the church in Galatia that they cannot serve the law and serve Christ at the same time. We ought to live in the power of and the direction of the Holy Spirit. We can, we can become conceited, proud, and arrogant when we try in our flesh to refrain from sin. Which, by the way, we can't do that. We can't. It's impossible for us within our power to refrain from sin. Life in the, in the spirit requires submission fully and totally to God. It requires humility. Understanding that without him we can do nothing. Nothing. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. It's about him. It's not about us. It's what he accomplished, not we accom- what, what, what we accomplish. Trying to lead a Christian life in our own power results in 
too much self-focus on ourselves, puffing us up and causing us to be self-righteous. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not about our righteousness, but his. A Holy Spirit life is a powerful, meaningful life. And the absolute pinnacle of the human experience on this side of heaven. And in the arena of liberty, freedom, the key is not to suppress the flesh. The key is to surrender to the Holy Spirit. As we surrender to the Holy Spirit, he works in and through us. Oftentimes as believers, we try to do the whole sin management thing. We get so caught up in what we shouldn't be doing that we ignore all the things that we should be doing. We say, I don't want to do this thing. And we end up obsessing over the thing that we shouldn't be doing and not doing the thing that we should be doing. And we have a tendency, and maybe it's just me, but I think most of us do have the tendency of overcomplicating things, right? But in reality, what we're reading is actually pretty simple. Or simple and complicated, or complicatedly simple. This is what I mean. If I do what I'm supposed to do, I won't even think about the things that I'm not supposed to do. The only time that I do what I'm not supposed to do is when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. See? Complicatedly simple. Walk in the Spirit, focus on the Lord, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Whatever your focus is, good or bad, you're going to do. Remember, your thoughts leads to actions. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, which says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Every thought, not some thoughts. Because sometimes I can't always identify what's, which is my thought or the enemy's thought, right? So every thought needs to be brought under captivity, under Jesus Christ. Walking in the Spirit isn't this arduous task, by the way. Like, oh man, i got to walk in the Spirit. No, it's a wonderful thing. It's exciting, right? Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit is incredible. The way the Lord leads and guides us is amazing. I was driving the other day, and I was just looking at God's beautiful creation, and I had to stop and take a picture. And then I was like, oh, I should probably pull over (laughs) and then take a picture of God's creation. But it was so stunningly beautiful outside. It was wonderful. And then as I was looking at the beauty, something came to mind. I know the God that created it. The beauty that I see, the sunset, and all the beauty that's in this state, I know the God who made that. That should, that should excite you. Too many believers miss all of the beauty because they're too busy caught up in trying to manage their sin. Completely focused on the wrong thing. By the way, you can't actually manage sin. Focus on Jesus, not on sin. Right? Isn't that interesting? The thing you focus on is what you're going to do. I like going to the range, right? And I like shooting at, you know, at targets. Now, generally speaking, yeah, I wanted to clarify, right? Now, generally speaking, whatever I aim at, whatever my sights are set is what I'm going to hit. 
So if I'm like, I don't want to hit that, I don't want to hit that, but my sights are set there, guess what I'm going to hit? That very thing that I don't want to hit. But if I set my sights on what I want to hit, generally speaking, I'll hit that. About six months ago, um, I, w- I, had a, I had a moment with the Lord. And it's, I don't just have moments. We spend time together quite a bit. But, you know, when I say moment, I mean I was kind of having a little bit of a pity party. Just me and God were invited to this party. And I was sitting in the car complaining a little bit about things and questioning a lot of the things that the Lord was doing at the time. And then I felt like the Lord was asking me, Nathan, what's your focus? And I was like, well, ministry. So ministry is a lot of different things. It's my wife, it's my kids. And uh, during that time period, there were some things going on with my kids. And I was focused on that as well. And I was like, Lord, ministry, right? And then the Lord laid upon my heart kind of heavy that I made a grave error. I was like, Lord, what do you mean? Ministry is a good thing. I should be focused on ministry and, you know, various aspects of ministry, my family, my kids, Lord, where you've placed me in the church, like that's my focus. That's what's supposed to be my focus. And he's like, no, it's not. Your focus is supposed to be me. Ministry happens when your focus is me. Ministry doesn't happen when, you're, when your focus is ministry. Ministry happens when your focus is Jesus. Walking in the spirit means walking with your eyes locked on Jesus. You guys remember Peter, Peter getting out of the boat, right? Walking on water. The Bible doesn't say how many steps he took. Could have been five, could have been 50, who knows, right? We don't know. But he's walking on water and everything's fine as long as his eyes are fixed on Jesus. But as soon as his eyes are off of Jesus, what happens? He sinks. So I was sinking. Because I was looking at all of these other things and my focus wasn't specifically on Jesus. Verse 17 of Galatians chapter 5. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish. You see because the flesh and the spirit are opposed to one another... We can't live according to both at the same time. I'm either in the flesh or in the spirit, never both. We must choose one. The two do not coexist. If we choose to live according to the flesh, we will experience the consequence of that. Right? Which is what? Death. But if we choose to walk in the spirit, we'll produce godly fruit unlike the works of the flesh, which lead to sin and destruction, the fruit of the Spirit leads to love and to joy and to peace and to patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Spirit and the flesh are dramatically opposed to one another. The result is a fierce and unrelenting conflict that takes place inside of us, in which we cannot, by the way, be victorious outside of the power of the Holy Spirit. But whatever we feed into will win that war or conflict inside of us. What are you feeding into? Are you feeding into the flesh or are you feeding into the spirit? There's a neat story that I heard some years ago, pastor shared. Um, It's called the story of the two wolves. And um, I'll read it to you because it's real cute. An old Cherokee Indian chief was teaching his grandson about life. And he said, a fight is going on inside of me, he told the young boy. A fight between two wolves. The dark one is evil. He's anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued... The light wolf is good. 
He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside of the grandson. And inside of every person on the face of this earth. The grandson ponders this for a moment and then asks grandfather, well, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee smiled and simply said, the one you feed. Are you feeding into the spirit? Are you feeding into the flesh? Verses 18 through 21 of chapter 5. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, unclean, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In verses 18 through 21, Paul begins to point out some of the sins we're inclined to take part in when we refuse to walk in the Spirit. Paul actually lists what sinful lifestyle looks like. He's giving examples of sinful behaviors which don't correspond to living free in Christ through, of course, the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 17 through 18 says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I actually love the NLT uh, translation of this. Which reads, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom is found in, uh, freedom is found in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Freedom is found in the Holy Spirit, not in our flesh. If you feel like you're in bondage, it's not because you're, you're walking in the Spirit. It's because you're walking in the flesh. The first three sinful lifestyles that Paul lists fall under sexual sin. The New King James Version uses adultery, fornication, unclean, uh, uncleanness, and lewd, uh, lewdness. But the ESV uh, translates it, the three first words, sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Now, sexual immorality is from the Greek word term pornea, where we get pornography from. And it basically, it's a catch-all term referring to any kind of sexual activity outside of biblical marriage, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, etc. Gaining victory over the flesh by keeping the law, by the way, is futile. But if we're led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. We are free from sin because the Holy Spirit does not lead us into sin, but he leads us into righteousness. Verse 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In verses 22 through 25, Paul begins with love, specifically the Greek term agape. This is a selfless love, expecting nothing in return, right? This is the type of love that's described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. It's the unconditional love, which, by the way, Jesus Christ embodies that if you read through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, if you were, were, were to replace the word love with the word Jesus, it would apply perfectly. But let's break down the fruit of the Spirit a little bit. So love is the first one, right? Our lives that are categorized 
and, and characterized by self-sacrificial service to God and others. Again, agape love. Joy. We will delight in knowing God and having a personal relationship with him. Joy in the biblical sense, that is. Joy is not circumstantial. It's not affected by the situation that you're in. So that means I can be joyful in the most miserable of situations. Joy isn't happiness. You know, it doesn't change depending on the weather. Yesterday it was like 105. It didn't mess with my joy. Might have impeded my happiness a little bit, but didn't mess with my joy, right? Some years ago, well, maybe more than some years ago, about 20 years ago, we went to Macau, China. And uh, Macau, China is this little small area of China, just outside of mainland China. And I think it's 500,000 um, square feet. And there's so many people that live in this little area. And we went and uh, did a mission trip and, and served with a church that was out there, Horizon Christian Fellowship. And it was awesome. It was a really um, terrific church and, and the Lord was doing really great work there and we had an opportunity to go out there and do outreaches and it was really incredible. But one of the things that I, that I noticed there is that the people were so joyful. And some of these people were living in these flats, right? Because there's not a lot of room there. But these flats were jam-packed with people, like 10 to 15 people per flat. And they were some of the most joyful, kind, happy people I'd ever met in my life. Their joy was not impeded by the condition that they were living in. Joy is not circumstantial. And it's not something that you produce. You can't conjure up joy. Like, I'm going to decide to be joyful. No, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Right? By the way, all of these are a fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that you can produce yourself. You don't have it from yourself, by the way. Have you ever tried to be joyful and you're really not? <laughs> and you try really hard? I choose joy. Do you? Because that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's something he infuses into your life. I'm going to have self-control. Are you? That comes from the Holy Spirit. So the only way, by the way, that you can have access to any of these is by walking in the Spirit. If you're not walking in the Spirit, guess what you won't have? These. Peace. We will be free from anxiety and worry. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your or guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Peace is the concept of restful, assured stillness. This is different from something frozen or fearful. It's not the same as being restrained, nor does it mean a lack of motivation. Biblical peace involves emotions such as assurance. And an overall sense of spiritual calm. Then we have long-suffering or patience. We will not lose our temper. Who here has ever lost their temper? Patience is the, is, is, is the ability, in the spirit of course, to wait on God's perfect timing even when our personal agenda seems to be failing. Waiting on God's timing. Who here has ever had to wait on God's timing? Who here has ever prayed for patience? Who here has regretted that prayer? <laughs> right? Well, it's, it's, is it a bad thing to pray? Of course not. Right? But again, that's not something that we conjure up. That's something that happens when we walk in the Spirit. I'll be okay with God's timeline. Well, Lord, this is not happening the way they think it should. This is, this is way outside of my, my time. Lord, I had this, that, and the other thing planned. And God's like, that's nice. 
my timing. My plans are perfect. My timing's impeccable, right? We need to satisfy ourselves with God's perfect timing. Scripture uses the term patience to mean an ability to endure hardship or to weather the storm. So sometimes you, you may be walking through a season that's really, really difficult. And you don't know how long it's going to last and you don't know that you are make it through to the other end. But I got to tell you, when you walk in the Spirit, God will give you the ability to endure, to weather the storm. Remember, everything is seasonal. Good seasons and bad seasons. They don't last forever. Kindness. We will genuinely consider the needs and concerns of others. Kindness may be simple, but it's not always easy. In the spirit, we can be kind to anyone, even those who are challenging and offensive. Does anybody know anybody challenging and offensive? <laughs> right? Kindness and niceness, by the way, are not the same thing. Um, kindness is what the Bible talks about. Niceness is what the world talks about. Um, niceness is a worldly concept to keep godly people from standing up or, for, or from speaking up when they should be speaking up. Niceness keeps our mouth shut. Kindness does not. Jesus was kind, but he spoke. And then there's goodness. We will be holy as God is holy. First Peter chapter 1 verse 16, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Goodness is the ability to do right in every circumstance. This describes someone respectable, honorable, and righteous. A person of integrity. Faithfulness. When we endure trials and tribulations, we will not forsake God or turn our backs on him. That's faithfulness. This represents a kind of endurance driven by trust. In the spirit, Christians can keep going in the right direction even when we don't fully understand all that God is doing. And we're reminded that we don't need to understand what God is doing. He doesn't need to give us an explanation. Lord, I don't get it. That's okay. You don't need to get it. Lord, I don't agree with it. That's okay. You don't need to agree with it. What God requires from you is obedience. Not understanding, not agreement. Gentleness. We'll have an attitude of grace and humility. And remember what the definition of grace is. The definition of grace is unmerited or undeserved favor. And humility. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Having an attitude of grace and humility. And then lastly, self-control. We will not be controlled by sinful impulses. In short, the fruit of the Spirit is evidence that we belong to Christ and are no longer controlled by our sin, sinful impulses. Instead, we are led by the Holy Spirit and we live according to the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 12, verses 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect in the perfect will of God. We must continue to walk by the Spirit and crucify or put to death the desires of the flesh. This is a daily journey that requires consistent effort, but God will complete the work that he began in us. Philippians 1 verse 6, right? So we have a responsibility to be available for God to work in. 
God does the doing. We have to be available for him to do, do the doing in, right? Lord, I don't think anything's changing. Well, are you available for him to change things? Are you willing for him to come in and change things in your life? Then verse 26 of chapter 5. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. When Paul left um, the Galatian church, he was generally satisfied with the condition that he left them in. But he feared that that could change. So he issues kind of a warning And he kind of targets some of the weak points that they, that they had kind of as a people. Fickleness, overly sensitive, easily offended, vanity, and quarrelsome disposition. Have you ever been around a person who's easily offended? You can't really say anything. You have to always walk on eggshells. Right? It's a difficult, those are difficult personalities. And, and, and what Paul's just kind of communicating here is like, don't be easily offended. Right? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? And for any of you who have siblings, you know that sometimes it can get a little bit difficult. Right? But the way to get through this is not to be easily offended. Don't get hurt feelings all the time. Right? Um, understand, uh, one of the things that I love about love, yes, I said that. One, one of the things I love about love, all right, uh, love believes all things. Like, don't believe the negative about people all the time, right? Don't do that. Well, their intent was, and they're trying to, well, don't be easily offended. Love. Have the frame of mind like, you know what, they probably didn't mean to do that. Sometimes it's good to talk about it to make sure that they didn't mean to do that? <laughs> right, I'll ask. Even my wife and I, right, we'll have conversations about different things. And by the way, if you didn't know, men and women communicate different. <laughs> I know this may be news to some of you. But sometimes what we do is we'll paraphrase, right? And she'll say something, and, I'm like, and I'll be like, did you just say this and this and this and this? She's like, yeah, but that's not what I meant, right? <laughs> or, or I'll say something, like as a guy, because sometimes guys say things pretty directly, right? And we don't really think about how it's going to land. We just say it. And so it comes out of the mouth, and then she'll say, did you just? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Well, I said it, but that's actually not what I meant to say, right? But walking in the Spirit is a wonderful thing. Um. And the enemy would love to, to take your joy. He doesn't want you living an abundant life. He wants you to wallow in your situation. He doesn't want you to have victory in Jesus. And sometimes it can be frustrating as a believer. You know, you've accepted Jesus Christ into your life. And you're like, but I don't feel like I'm really li living in the spirit. I feel like I'm living in the flesh. Whenever that happens, chances are that you've been trying to do this by yourself. You can't. It's never been by your effort. It's effort it's always been his allow the Lord Jesus to lead and direct your steps ask him to take over not some of your life but all of your life there's a cute story I heard a long time ago and it's about a man that um, and this is a fictional story but I but I think it makes a good point we find ourselves in difficult situations and then we're like, oh my goodness, Lord, how do I end up here? Lord, why aren't you taking over? I gave you my life. Well, let me tell you the story. It's cute. So there's a man who buys a house and it's his dream house and he loves this house. This is his favorite house ever. This is the house that he's always been wanting. So he buys the house and he's living there for a couple of years, loves living in the house. 
Then he gets a knock on the door. He opens up the door and it's Satan. And then Satan beats him up and wrecks his house. And sometime later it happens again. And this happens a few times. And then finally this man runs into Jesus and says, Jesus, oh my goodness, Satan has been knocking on my door and wrecking my house and beating me up. Can you come live in my house? Jesus is like, of course, I'd love to come live in your house. Cool. So the man brings Jesus to his home, takes him upstairs and says, hey, Jesus, this is your room. You can do whatever you want in this room. All you. So Jesus moves in. Sometime later, he gets a knock on the door. Guess who it is? It's Satan. Satan beats him up again. And the man's all frustrated, goes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, I let you in my house. And you're living in my house. And Satan knocked on the door and he still beat me up. Jesus is like, well, you gave me a room upstairs. Well, fine, the guy says. You can have the whole upstairs. And you can have the room downstairs. Right? Right next to the front door. Some time goes by. He gets a knock on the door. Guess what? It's Satan again. Satan beats him up. And this time he's super frustrated. He says, Jesus, Satan, just beat me up. And you're living in the house. And you even have the, the room right next door to the front. What's going on? Jesus said, well, you only gave me the upstairs and the room right next to the front door. Well, you can have the kitchen. You can have the dining room. You can have all of the other rooms, okay? Time goes by again. Gets a knock on the door. And this time Satan is there, but beats the guy up worse than he's ever been beat up before. And he's trashed. And the guy comes and he's weeping. And he says, Jesus, I gave you like most of my house. Like I gave you all the rooms and the kitchen even, the upstairs, even my own bedroom I gave you. Jesus is like, hmm, kind of looking at the guy. And then the guy gets an epiphany. He's like, oh my goodness. And then he takes, all, takes out his keys and he hands them to Jesus. Now the next time the enemy came knocking at the door, guess who opened up? Jesus did. You cannot give some of your life to the Lord. You have to give all of your life to the Lord. So if you find yourself powerless in certain areas, perhaps it's because you've only given some of who you are to the Lord. Certain areas of your life. Lord, you can have this, but this thing I'll take, I'll take care of myself. That's not how it works. Um, I remember uh, our old pastor, Pastor Jack, used to say something that I think is incredibly true and very impactful. If he's not Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. There are steps that you can take. Absolutely steps that you can take. To walk in the spirit. And I'm going to give you three steps. And I'm going to challenge you to, to walk these things out. The first one is. Commit to prayer. Spend time in prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 17 says, pray without ceasing. That means pray all the time. That should be your attitude when you wake up in the morning, throughout the day, be in a state of prayer. If communication is the lifeblood of a marriage, wouldn't it be the lifeblood of relationship that you have with God? The second one is commit to the word, commit to reading God's word specifically. Read your Bible every single day. Spend time in your Bible. Now, some people are like, well, how do I do that? Do I like start a book and I read through a book a day? No, don't do that. Well, should I read a chapter a day? I don't know, maybe for you, but I wouldn't even do that. If I'm supposed to meditate on God's word, it's really hard to meditate on a whole chapter. Take verses and meditate on verses throughout the day. Start in a book, start in chapter one, verse one, and then read a couple of verses and meditate on those verses and make that a thing and do that every single day. And then third, commit to obedience. Right? John 14, 15, if you love me, you will be, we, Jesus said, you will obey my commands. So whatever he says, do, do. 
And he says, if, if Jesus tells you to do something now, then do it now. Because remember, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Start there. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with the Lord. Well, there's no better time than the present. As we heard earlier in the announcements, we even have baptisms going on in between services. And uh, the, after the first service, um, Joe actually gave the message of the first service, and after the first service, there were baptisms that took place, and then after this service, there's going to be baptisms that take place, and then after the third service, when Matt teaches, there's going to be baptism that takes, that takes place. So, this would be an awesome time for you to give your life to the Lord and then be baptized right away, right? So, I'm actually praying, and this morning we were praying in a group before the service started, and my prayer is that if somebody's here this morning that hasn't given their life to the Lord, that you would, right? Because it's the most important decision that you'll ever make in your life, right? Because you're not promised tomorrow, right? You, could, you can walk out of the door and slip on a banana peel, hit your head, and that would be it, right? You don't know how long you have. You have now. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 says, For God says, At just the right time I heard you, on the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. There is no better time than the present. I don't know what you've been walking through in your life, where you've been, but guess who knows? God, your creator, the one who knit you together in your mother's room knows. The one who knows how many hairs you have on your head knows. The one who can hear your thoughts from a distance knows. That is the God that it says in Isaiah 52, 14, was mutilated beyond human recognition for you. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You. If you ever, didn't, if you ever felt in your life that you were not valuable, I want you to think about that. The God who created the cosmos with his fingers, this vast and amazing and wonderful God who created all of this beauty that we get to see is mindful of you. He died on the cross for you so that you can have a relationship with him. So as the band comes forward, I would like to say a prayer. And this is for people who have not accepted Christ into their life before. Today is the day of salvation. And so I'm going to say a prayer. And I would like for you to pray with me. Lord, you're so good. Lord, your grace and your mercy are at times overwhelming. Your love is spectacular. Lord, the fact that you have thoughts toward us, Lord, that you're mindful of us, Lord, that you hear us when we call you, Lord, is, it's amazing. Lord, but there's people here this morning that don't know you. People that have been walking in darkness. But Lord, you're the God of light. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that this morning would be the morning that they would give their lives to you. 
So I'm going to say this prayer, and I want you, if you haven't accepted Christ into your heart, to pray this along with me. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for my trespasses. Forgive me for the things that I've done intentionally and unintentionally that have gone against your will, against your law. I repent of my sins, my shortcomings. And I ask you to take control in my life. Lord, I want you to take residence in me. Lord, not just part of my life, but all of my life. I ask you that you lead me and guide me. I pray that you teach me. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my mind, my thoughts. I give you all the broken pieces. Do with me as you will, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.